A few years ago, I was watching this really fascinating documentary on television, and it was all about cults in America. And during that program, I learned the eight characteristics of a cult, and I'd like to read them to you. Number one, the leadership dictates how members should think, act, and feel. Number two, there is no tolerance for questions or critical, critical inquiry. Number three, rational thought is discouraged or forbidden. Number four, the group has a polarized us versus them mentality and an unreasonable fear of the world. Number five, leadership induces feelings of shame or guilt in order to influence or control its members. Number six, followers feel they are never good enough. Number seven, the group is elitist, claiming special exalted status. And number eight, the group is preoccupied with bringing in new members. Those are the eight characteristics of a cult. Now, when I read those characteristics, I realize that there are people I know right now living in West Michigan who belong to cults. And those cults are churches. Now, maybe you yourself know people in your life, family members, friends, and neighbors, who belong to a cult, but that cult is a Christian church. I'm going to read to you those eight things again. It says, the le leadership dictates how members should think, act, and feel. There's no tolerance for questions or critical inquiry. Rational thought is discouraged or forbidden. The group has a polarized us versus them mentality and an unreasonable fear of the world. Leadership induces feelings of shame or guilt in order to influence or control its members. Followers feel they are never good enough. The group is elitist, claiming special exalted status. And the group is preoccupied with bringing in new members. People who blindly follow what they're told to believe, who never question who never bring rational thought into it, those people belong to a cult. Now we, at Douglas UCC, we are part of a Christian church, a Christian denomination. But if you notice, our mission statement says we are a church that is more about the questions than the answers. It says we value questions more than answers. Last Sunday, on Easter Sunday, the holiest day of the Christian church, I stood on this very altar and I questioned whether Jesus actually rose from the dead. I shared my doubts about that. That would be shocking to say in 99.9% .9 of Christian churches in West Michigan, if not America. Okay? Now, people come to religion because they want the answer. And there are plenty of churches that will give you the answer. This isn't one of them. I don't have your answer. I don't. But just because we don't have the answer, it doesn't mean that we're not people of great faith. As we heard in our words of integration, we've kind of been led to believe that if we have questions or doubts about our faith, something we read in the Bible that doesn't quite sound right, that that means that we're not believers. And that just isn't the truth. The spiritual writer, Anne Lamott, Christian writer, she says, the opposite of faith isn't doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty. 
I know so many Christians who are so certain that they have the answer. The church said it, I believe it, no further discussion. And this answer is for everybody. Whether you live in China, India, wherever, this is the answer. I'm certain of it. That is not faith. That's the opposite of faith. Just this week in the New York Times, there was an editorial entitled, God is a question, not an answer. And it was written by Professor William Irvin. And he said in, in that editorial, belief without doubt would not be required of an all-loving God. And it should not be worn as a badge of honor. People who claim certainty about God worry me, both those who believe and those who don't believe. They do not really listen to the other side of conversations, and they are ready to impose their views on others. It is impossible to be certain about God. It is impossible to be certain about God. That seems almost heretical to say, but there's an, an arrogance to say, I have the answer. In our humility, we have to say, I don't know. And that's okay. That's part of the spiritual quest. The greatest spiritual people ever questioned and doubted. Mother Teresa, one of the most saintly figures in our lifetime, her journals were published after she died. And throughout those journals, she doubted her faith. In one of the last journal entries that she wrote in the, the last part of her life, she even questioned whether God existed. Now, that doesn't mean that she wasn't a woman of strong faith. It's just the opposite. She was a woman of strong faith because she questioned and doubted. And that's why I always thought that Thomas in today's gospel got a really bad rap. Because we always think of him as he was the bad apostle. All the other ones believed, but he didn't. And we even came up with that term now. For anybody who's skeptical, we say, oh, you're a doubting Thomas. He was never referred to doubting Thomas in the Bible. And he wasn't the bad apostle. Let's look at, at the story together. The other apostles weren't so faith-filled. Think about it. They locked themselves in a room in fear. And I am sure that during that week they were locked together, they were expressing their doubts about, oh wow, we thought this guy was our Messiah and was going to save us, and now he's been killed, and I don't know, maybe we were wrong. I'm sure they were expressing their doubts. What I love is that Thomas wasn't with them. He wasn't locked in fear. He was out and about. Then he comes back. And he doesn't say to them, you guys are liars. I don't believe you. <laughs> it's not what he says. He says, you had an experience of the risen Christ. You felt his presence. The spirit breathed on you and you felt it. I didn't. I'm not going to believe just because of your secondhand information. I want to experience it for myself. I want to know it firsthand. Then I'll believe when I experience it. I don't want to hear that someone else experienced it and believe because of that. I want to believe because I experienced it. Now some of you know that there is a gospel of Thomas. But it's not in the Bible. The early Christians who put the Bible together, they didn't include that one. 
And if you were with us a few Sundays ago, I mentioned that there's another gospel, the gospel of Mary Magdalene. They didn't include that one either. These gospels have been verified by historians. They're real. And these gospels are referred to as the Gnostic gospels. The Gnostics were people like Thomas and Mary Magdalene who believed that we could have first-hand experience of the Christ. We could have that intimate knowledge. The reason the early church didn't include those books is because if you knew that, why would you need the church? The Gnostics were referred to that name because Gnostic means knowing. That's what the word means. But it doesn't mean knowing up here in your head. It's not intellectual knowledge. It's knowing intimately. That's what knowledge means in the Bible. Intimacy. Having first-hand knowledge for yourself. That's what they meant, the Gnostics. We've got to, as Christians, get back in touch with those Gnostic voices who were calling us to intimacy. Now, I shared with you last Sunday on Easter that I had my questions and doubts about whether Jesus physically rose from the dead, but I also said, I believe in the resurrection, and I do. And the reason I believe it is because I have experienced it. I have first-hand knowledge. I have experienced the risen Christ in my life. I have felt his presence, his guidance, his love. When I am in the quiet, when I am in the stillness, I feel him, even though he died over 2,000 years ago. I didn't physically see him. It's like Jesus says in today's gospel, you don't have to see to believe, but I know. I believe, because I heard it firsthand. I experienced it firsthand. I don't believe because somebody told me to believe, and I think that's what so many people um, who proclaim to be Christians they believe because, well, since they were little kids, they were told, this is what you believe in. Here, here it is. And we've never questioned those things. All of us in this room are on a spiritual quest. We are on a spiritual quest to, to discover the truth. And I love the word quest because it's an adventure, but it's also part of the word questioning. If you're going to go on a spiritual quest, you've got to question. And so what we have to look at are all of those unquestioned beliefs that we got as kids from our churches, from our parents, from our society. We've just taken them on unquestioningly. Well, of course, I mean, everybody said that, so it must be true. What this gospel calls us to is experience it yourself. If you want to feel the risen Christ for yourself, Jesus gave us the instructions to do that. Don't say that you believe because somebody else told you to believe. Believe because you have intimate first-hand knowledge of it for yourself. <clears throat> that is why prayer and meditation are so important. That is how we connect with that presence within us. Father Richard Rohr said, we have taken Christianity and we've turned it into a religion of belonging and believing. I belong to a church and I believe. But he said Christianity should be a religion of transformation. We should be transforming ourselves into the divine to feel the risen Christ within us. That's what Christianity should be. That's what Jesus was trying to teach us. And Jesus said that the way we experience that is in the stillness. It's be still and know. Know means intimacy. Not be still and study, 
Not be still and go to a Bible study and study theology. Be still and know intimately that this presence and power is within you. And that you're here to bring it forth. Be still and know that I am God. This is the Easter season. This is the season where we proclaim Alleluia. And as an Easter people, what we're being called to go forth and do is to transform our thoughts, our unquestioned beliefs. It says in the scripture, be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's how you transform yourself according to scripture, by the renewal of your mind. All of those unquestioned beliefs that you've just taken on your whole life, start questioning them. That's how you'll be transformed, through the renewal of your mind. So let us go forth and do that this week. Let's all of us find time to be still, to bring our doubts and questions to the light, and then to feel the resurrection, the risen Christ within us. Let us go forth and be people who humbly live the questions rather than people who arrogant, arrogantly proclaim that we have the answers for everyone. Namaste. Uh -huh.